So he is a microbiologist for a living and a home brewer for a hobby. So he'll be talking about uh, wild yeast and collecting wild yeast and fermenting with wild yeast and all that fun stuff. Um, so All right. uh, I was already introduced briefly, but I thought I might just introduce myself uh, a little bit here. Uh, so I'm uh, a scientist by day. I sort of do microbiology, uh, but I'm more on the, the immune system side of, of what happens uh, when we encounter microbes. Uh, and I'm also a home brewer. Uh, I've been home brewing for about 21 years, but now that I have little kids and whatnot, I seem to only do it on the rare weekend evening, you know, long after the sun has set. Uh, but I've been interested for years on brewing with wild yeast and bacteria and doing mixed fermentations, those sorts of things. Uh, so I blog about this a fair amount on my website, uh, Sui Generis Brewing, uh, and I have a, a YouTube channel where I don't think I've put a new video up for about two years, but one day I swear I might uh, yet again put a new video on, maybe this one. Thank you for inviting me. I'm going to try and keep this short, so I'm only going to cover a small number of topics. The main focus is going to be on how to capture wild yeast and brewery friendly bacteria for use in your home brewery. Now your first question is probably going to be where do you find these bugs? And the answer is pretty much anywhere you might be. If you think about your average home, uh, it's going to be covered in lactobacilli because they are a major component of the bacteria on our skin. And of course these are important for making sour beer. As home brewers I can guarantee your homes are full of yeast, although these are most likely brewing strains but you can still capture them. If you look outside, uh, any tree bark, the nuts, fruit, green pine cones, and really any sort of living plant matter can be used as a source of both yeast and bacteria. Even the air is filled with yeast and bacteria. Whether you're in the city or in the count, uh, country, there's going to be lots of bacteria and yeast flying around. Anywhere there's someone farming is going to have a lot of these as well, whether it's your little vegetable garden at home, an orchard, or a farmer's field. And believe it or not, insects are probably the single best source for these things. Uh, keep in mind, yeast bacteria can't fly, so they rely on things like bugs to take them around. Uh, things that live off of sugar are best, so bees and fruit flies are great sources. Now it turns out that yeast originated in soil and, and leaf litter, and so you can sample these as well, but it is a higher risk due to the presence of pathogens in these places. When you start a wild fermentation, it's well established that multiple things will happen. What I'm showing on this chart is a summary of data from a couple of different papers. What we're looking at on the y-axis is the number of each organism. On the x-axis is the time starting from brew day and extending out to about one year. For wild fermentations, it's typical to go between one year and 18 months, uh, sometimes even longer. The first organisms that appear in a wild ferment are actually things we don't want. Uh, these include enteric bacteria like E. coli and some other food poisoning uh, organisms, as well as oxidative yeast. Uh, these don't make much alcohol, they mostly make off flavor, so we don't want them either. That's the bad news, but the good news is they disappear in about a month, uh, mostly because alcohol and other acids made by yeast and lactobacilli outcompete them. So on that note, the next thing that appears are fermentative yeast, which are the brewer's yeast. Uh, these will make alcohol, they'll also do some acidification. Starting at about the same time, we'll start to see the growth of some lactobacilli, and these will produce a lot of the lactic acid that sours the beer. And it's really the combined effect of the uh, alcohol and acid that actually kill off those enteric bacteria and oxidative yeast that we don't want. Later in fermentation, pediococcus will appear. This is another lactic acid producing bacteria, which will further acidify the beer and create a more complex acid profile. Lastly, Britannomyces will appear. These yeasts produce a lot of the funky character that's associated with wild beer. I would add, though, that these last two organisms are not always captured. In fact, I don't think I've ever once captured a wild Britannomyces, and even Pediococcus seems to be about 50% of captures. Of course, even if you have these in your culture, if you are not using the cultures over long periods of time, you may never actually see these organisms or get any of their character into your beer. You might be asking why you'd want to go through this. It's one way to create a classical style like Lambic or Flanders Red, but using your local uh, biota instead of a uh, bottle culture or a commercial culture. You can explore the unique flavors and characters imparted by your area's microbial terroir. A lot of you people use this to make their own house cultures, giving them something totally unique in their home brewery. 
And of course, like Everest, some people just do it because they can. There is no one way uh, to do a wild capture. I'm going to present a couple of methods, uh, but these are just a few out of over a dozen ways to do it. Every single method has its own strengths and weaknesses. Some give you a better chance of success, some have different levels of risk attached to them, and some give you more or less control over what it is you capture. Now I'm going to present just a few options. The first is cool shipping. This is where you literally just brew a beer, and while it's still hot, you stick it outside with the lid off, and you let it cool exposed to air. Uh, this is how Lambic and, uh, are traditionally brewed, and you're basically just collecting wild yeast and bacteria from the air and from whatever insects happen to fall in. Your second option is to take objects such as fruit or flowers, put them in a tube, and add some wort and see if anything grows. Your third option is sort of a small scale cool ship. So you can take a jar or flask of wort and place it outside to see if you can capture some yeast. And the last option, which I'm not going to cover because it's a very complex topic, is to purify single strains from any of the methods uh, used to capture wild yeast. Now this can be very involved and I have a lot of videos on my YouTube channel which cover these processes. When we look at these methods we are looking at different levels of risk, chances of success, and the degree of control over what is captured. Risk tends to be less when sampling objects or the environments. For cool ships the risk is losing whole batches of beer uh, because of contamination. Uh, you know, there's times where I've thrown out five or even ten gallons of beer because it did not turn out. The risk of single strains is a little bit different because you have the possibility of actually isolating something pathogenic. So it's really important if you're starting to do this that you really know what you're doing and that you proceed carefully. With success rates, my experience is that cool ships give a good beer 50 to 60 percent of the time, uh, with total dumpers occurring maybe in one in every eight beers. Because you can taste and smell test cultures from objects or the environment before you brew with them, success rates are much higher because you can pre-choose which cultures it is that you use. With purified strains, success rates tend to drop, and this is simply because it often takes the screening of a dozen strains or even more, simply to find one that's okay. And exceptional strains occur only uh, rarely. Your level of control is lowest for cool ships, mostly because the other methods allow you to control to some extent the types of organisms you capture, which is what I'm going to spend a fair amount of time talking about later in the video. To quickly go through these methods, to cool ship a beer is very simple. Uh, brew a beer. If you want it sour, brew it with low IBUs. If you want it uh, less tart, uh, increase the IBUs above, say, 10. Gravities between 1035 and 1065 are good places to start, although you can go higher. And if you live in a city or a place that has, uh, say, raccoons or cats, you may want a heavy screen to keep them out. But make sure the mesh size of that is big enough to let insects through, because they carry a lot of the yeast and bacteria we're looking for. I've done these at all times of year with success, but I find they do work best when nighttime temperatures are around freezing. The process of culturing from objects is a little different. You want to start with sterile tubes. I prefer single-use uh, 50 mil centrifuge tubes, which you can purchase from eBay or from lab supply stores. Place your object in the tube and add wort or another appropriate growth medium like wine must. About 6 or 12 hours later, you want to remove the object because if it floats, mold can grow on it and ruin your culture. You then want to either cap the tube lightly or even better, add an airlock and let it ferment at least one month. This will give the yeast and uh, lactic acid bacteria enough time to kill off anything potentially dangerous. After a month, smell the culture. If it smells good, so it smells like beer, maybe a little funky, uh, but certainly not like vomit or mold or anything like that, uh, you can then start trying to do small scale test ferments to see if it's a culture you want to continue working with, or you can go whole hog and just uh, use it in a beer. Uh, when it comes to small scale cultures, I like to use wine or beer bottles uh, because I can run you know, a dozen samples or so in parallel and it doesn't cost me much in terms of uh, wort or time. Sampling from the environment is simple. Just prepare wort somewhere around 1040, put it in a container with a large opening. I really like to use uh, canning jars uh, because of their, their large opening. Uh, in this example, I've actually used the canning lid to hold on a piece of mesh to keep out insects. This is actually not an ideal way to do it. I've since found that um, leaving it wide open works much better. You then place the jar somewhere you want to collect yeast. Maybe your backyard, maybe a place you vacation, maybe you want to do some gorilla yeast culturing and you know sneak into an orchard or something like that. About 12 hours later, transfer that to a flask and a cap with an airlock. 
Again, you want to ferment for at least a month to make sure it's safe, and if it smells good, test it in a small scale or full scale ferment. As I mentioned, I'm not going to discuss purifying strains. On my YouTube page, I have two series, Hunting Wild Yeast and Your Home Lab Made Easy. These uh, video series go into these processes in a great deal, and if you're interested, please look at them. Once you have your culture, you, the next thing is to test it to make sure uh, that it's good and to make sure that it's safe to use. Before you start tasting these cultures or brewing with them, it is critical that you make sure you assess it carefully. It's best to perform these tests using a neutral base beer uh, so that the character of these really come through. I prefer something lightly hopped, uh, mostly just bittering hops uh, with all or mostly base malt. This really lets these characters and aroma shine through, uh, which makes it a lot easier to figure out if it's a culture you want to work with. The first step is to assess the appearance. If the wort looks like beer in color, uh, whether that's cloudy or clear, uh, you're good to move on to the next step. If it's taken on an odd color or has become viscous or gelled or anything like that, you want to dump it. If there's a pellicle, you also need to assess that. It should be neutrally colored. Uh, if the pellicle is colored or it looks like it's made of small hairs, it's probably mold and again you need to dump that culture. There's a special case here though. Uh, if it looks like there's slimy fingers in the beer, it may be pediococcus, at which point the culture is fine, uh, but it may also be less desired bugs. So you can move forward, but you want to do so cautiously. Next up, smell your culture. It should smell like beer. There might be funky notes or fruity notes or spicy notes. That's all fine. But if it smells unpleasant, anything like body odor or vomit or anything like that, it likely has enteric bacteria in it and you want to get rid of that right away. The third thing is to measure attenuation. If there's more than 60% attenuation or the beer gets above 4% alcohol, it should be safe. If it's 40 to 60% attenuation, you don't want to use that yeast on its own, but it may work if you add a commercial yeast uh, to work alongside it. Anything less than 40% attenuation or anything less than 2% uh, alcohol is a failure and should be dumped. Now if you have access to pH testing equipment, you can also look to see if the pH is below 4.5. If it is, you're good to move on. If it isn't, you might be okay to move on, you might not. It uh, depends on your level of uh, comfort with risk. If all the tests are passed, it's now time to taste the culture. You always want to start with a small sample, just enough to wet your palate and move up from there. Uh, you want to assess carefully what aromas are present, what flavors are present. Is that balance of aroma and flavor pleasing? Uh, would it work with a style of beer that are ingredient that you enjoy? Uh, the character of these yeasts can vary hugely. I've had some that completely strip the beer of all flavor and just leave like a dull flat mess behind. Others are incredibly bold uh, to the point where they're completely unusable. You know, they make things taste like melted plastic and stale bananas and things like that. But many of them do produce satisfying beers, uh, especially if you take care to pair them with the right malts, hops, and maybe some spices or fruit. Uh, the last thing you want to assess is mouthfeel. Now most wild yeasts tend to be quite attenuative and leave behind very dry beers. Uh, this can be uh, further accentuated when you have lactic acid bacteria present, which will acidify and, and increase that uh, dryness. But there are some strains that do produce a lot of glycerol, if it's one that produces a bit of that, it can give you a nice mouthfeel, particularly in something like a wild wine or a cider. Uh, but a lot of times these can get into the range where it feels oily or even slimy, uh, which is downright unpleasant and can really ruin an otherwise pleasant yeast. Uh, when you're successful, you can find some really interesting and fun strains to play with. Uh, and they're, they're yeast strains that you might enjoy using for years to come. I know I'm going a little long, so I'm going to wrap up as quick as I can, uh, but I just want to quickly mention how you can optimize your culture conditions to promote the growth of specific organisms or to suppress the growth of things you don't want. In simple terms, we can control four factors when we make a culture media that can either promote the growth of things we want or can suppress the growth of things we want to exclude. We can pre-adjust the pH using lactic or phosphoric acid uh, to suppress uh, enteric bacteria and mold. We can add hops uh, somewhere around the neighborhood of 20 to 40 IBUs to suppress lactic acid bacteria. Uh, 
We can add alcohol by adding uh, vodka or another unflavored spirit uh, to suppress enteric bacteria as well as to promote the growth of uh, alcohol tolerant yeast. This is particularly important if you're trying to produce say a mead or a cider or a wine that's above 10 percent. Lastly we can restrict oxygen entry to suppress the growth of molds and oxidative yeasts. So to wrap up, I'll go through three media formulations uh, that allow us to tweak the way we capture organisms in order to uh, achieve specific end goals. So a way to simply reduce your risk while cool shipping or collecting environmental samples is to take a wort around 1040 gravity and just pre-pH it below 4.5 using lactic or phosphoric acid and after capture cap that with an airlock to limit oxygen exposure. This will allow yeast and lactic acid bacteria and Britannomyces uh, to grow but that low pH will suppress enteric bacteria and the absence of oxygen will limit oxidative yeast. So this increases your chance of having a successful culture. If you want to selectively capture yeast but not bacteria, you can take that same 1040 wort pre-pH to below 4.5, but make sure you've added about 15 or more IBUs to it. Those hops will suppress um, lactic acid bacteria, while the other ingredients will suppress enteric bacteria, molds, and oxidative yeast. This can give you a fairly pure culture of yeast, although it's still a mixed culture. You're going to have different species and types of yeast in there. Now a more extreme example of that yeast capture media is to basically take that same media but use a higher gravity wort and to add enough vodka to get between 5 to 8% alcohol before you do your capture. Along with the hops, pre-acidification and airlock, this is going to suppress all of those bacteria, molds, and uh, oxidative yeast that you don't want. While well, that higher alcohol level and the higher gravity ensures that the yeast which survive are both tolerant to high alcohol levels and able to ferment to well over 10%. This is a great way to purify yeast cultures for use in wild wines and meads. So that's it. I know I went a little long and I apologize, but if there's any questions, I'll take them. So are there labs out there that we can, after culturing some of this yeast, send it to to understand better a breakdown of what we have? So there is. I believe Bootleg Biology offers that service. There are also a number of commercial labs and academic labs that can do it. Uh, the cost of it, though, can be fairly high. And to be honest, for most uh, brewing purposes, it doesn't really matter as long as they taste good. Like how, how long would you say you're able to keep a culture alive? Like, is it something you're able to use again and again, like generated, or is it a one shot per, per use thing? How long you can keep a culture alive for really depends on how you use it. I have a Solera that's about seven years old, and some of those in there are wild cultures that have been there since the beginning. Uh, if you use them once and don't save them, uh, they'll be gone in one round. Uh, there are other methods like freezing you can use, which are a little more advanced, but I have videos on that if you're interested. So the answer really is it depends on how you use it. And quick, um, like, out of per attempt, how often do you say you get something you care about, something you want to reuse? Like, what's your success? So my success rate really varies depending on what I'm doing. Uh, like I said earlier, with cool ships, Somewhere around half of the time I'll get a nice beer out of it. One in eight, it's something I dump, and the remainder is something where it, it's beer, but it's not fantastic. Uh, for isolated cultures, I tend to isolate a large number of cultures in parallel and winnow them down to you know one or two that I really like. So my success rate there is pretty high, uh, but sort of with the caveat that I'm running a lot of things in parallel, and most of those cultures end up being tossed and it's really just the ones that kind of went through that process that I keep. So when I when I think about doing the environmental captures in you know like a, a beaker or whatever vessel it is, um, is it better if I want to have consistency in that beer as I go forward to uh, clone that yeast pre or post pinch? So I find these cultures change a lot the first time you use it and will change less on subsequent repitches. So to have a consistent culture, I tend to like to keep it after the second or maybe even later repitches. Uh, that way you know that it's sort of reached an equilibrium. 
That said, sometimes they'll brew with something right out of the gate, or maybe it's a culture from a location you'll know you'll never get back to. And then it's perfectly fine to save that initial culture before you've even brewed a full beer with it, you know, just that culture from the capture flask. Um, so I'm not sure where you're located, but uh, Jersey City is like the heart of the, you know, biggest urban environment in the country. Uh, do you know if there are any, like, risks with trying to harvest yeast where there might be all sorts of pollution and other stuff that? In the heart of a major city is perfectly fine. Keep in mind, you know, anywhere there's a little bit of plant growth or even, you know, just soda spilled on the street, there's going to be insects and stuff that live off of it. There's going to be the yeast that live in those insects. It's going to get in the air off of the soil and the leaves. And so you are going to find these organisms everywhere, whether you're in a large city or out in the country. Uh, there really isn't any different in risk. And in my experience, uh, no real difference in your chance of success. I think we're all good. Thank Thank you for your time and your talk. It was a wonderful talk. Thank All you. Right. Thank you for having me. I hope you enjoyed it. All right. Thank you for having me. I hope you enjoyed it.